We are meeting today to talk about strategy and planning for FOI requesting sites, which can affect sites of all ages, from very new to very old, like our site, what do they know, for example. Um, here at My Society, we have had many discussions in the past about where what do they know is going, what the goal is, what we're trying to achieve. And that's the kind of thing we're going to delve in today. Um, in this conversation, how three very different sites have figured out the answers to these questions, set their direction, and then flown with it. Um, after we've heard from all the sites, we're gonna have about 30 minutes to ask questions and also have a bit of discussion amongst ourselves. So we're gonna touch on things like, what feels challenging in setting a strategy and keeping to it, what's working well, what isn't, and starting to think about what we want to change or achieve with our sites. Um, after the call, I'm gonna post a message to the Google group. Uh, do let me know if you don't have a access to that or if you don't want to be a member and want me to find another way to include you um, and then that will be where we continue the conversation that we're starting today some housekeeping quickly before we move on to the presentations so we're going to be recording the presentations you probably heard the message as you joined um, this is so that people can watch them after the event we won't record the discussion or the questions so people can speak freely and kind of talk about things that are bothering them without worrying about it being enshrined on the internet forever um, keeping that in mind, please stay on mute throughout the presentations and pop any questions or comments that come up during the presentations into the chat. Okay, with no further ado, our first presentation comes from Martin Sislikan from Pidelad.info in Mexico. Martin will talk us through this very different way of approaching FOI. Go ahead, Martin. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Sislikan. Uh, I am originally from Argentina, but I'm currently in Mexico. Um, and this is my presentation for pidala.info, ask more, ask better. And this little fella here is P. P is our mascot, it's a mouse. Um, I mean, I also have some uh, wooden sculptures, but you, you're not going to get the joy of looking at them today. Um, so um, what's Pidala Info? Pidala Info, it's a project by Abrimos.info. Abrimos.info is our global brand for all of our civic tech projects um, that promotes the right to access to information by creating new tools. Uh, the users for Pidala Info are activists, journalists, researchers, lawyers that regularly make requests and need to handle great amounts of information. Uh, so access to public information in Mexico. Uh, this, the right to access uh, public information has been uh, in place for the past 21 years, uh, starting in uh, June 2000. Three, uh, we have 8.7 million answered requests in the database. Um, these requests have been answered by 7.6 thousand, so seven, yeah, seven thousand uh, institutions that are bound by the by the law, um, and the INAI, the National Institute of Access to Information and Data Protection, INAI. Uh, they are a great institution. They are an autonomous um, entity uh, that uh, support uh, the National Transparency Platform, which uh, has this uh, really cool animated GIF that we, you see in the background uh, while it loads. It's, uh, I think they, they were trying to simulate the spinning wheel in the Mac uh, platform. Uh, and they did this. Uh, it's really fun. And you will see a lot of uh, animated gifs in this presentation. Uh, what, uh, what's the use for the right uh, to access to information? Uh, for example, this is a project we did uh, with some partners uh, for the, during the COVID pandemic, uh, we tried to understand what were the expenses uh, that uh, institutions were incurring uh, to cover the pandemic uh, costs, uh, such as the 
uh, protection materials and uh, cleaning uh, and stuff. Uh, but uh, not all Mexican institutions publish their contracts in the same uh, place. The economy ministry, or yeah, that's a translation. Well, but these people, they publish a data set, uh, but it doesn't include every institution. So we did, uh, we had to do every, uh, every week, uh, like, I don't know, 60 uh, public information requests asking for an update for these institutions that were not publishing their contracts um, in the centralized source. Um, and we were able to reconstruct uh, the spending uh, for most of uh, the federal state institutions um, and to analyze it. And this was uh, a, quite a, a, in, an interesting undertaking. Uh, and we were asking to them, um, it was uh, 163 institutions and 55, the ones who answered uh, with contracts. Um, and we were asking some for some very specific uh, information, such as uh, the amount of the product they were purchasing, the unit price. Um, so this was, uh, yeah, we did some very, we created some very useful databases. Uh, so uh, for people doing these kinds of projects, um, the National Transparency Platform was not really uh, very useful if you need to do hundreds of requests. Um, so we created a Chrome extension for the browser so you can automate uh, the, uh, the request process. Uh, so we created this, uh, not the cat, but the, 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 form, the form here uh, where you could select uh, your institutions um, either by, by state or filtering by word, and you could see which ones were selected. Um, and this was a, a really uh, a great improvement on top of the original um, request form. Um, and uh, but you, since you needed to be logged in to the platform to do this, the only way to improve the, the form was uh, with a Google Chrome extension. So the Google Chrome extension would come in in your browser and switch the form for the new one. And this way you could select a limit, a limited amount of, um, of entities to send your request to. Uh, then um, there's another problem with uh, requests is that um, they don't notify you about every uh, change of state. Uh, let's say they are asking for more information or even some answers, they don't send you an email about those. Not everyone does. So the extension would monitor in the background every five minutes whether, whether or not there's been a change of state in your, um, in your requests uh, and update these summaries here in, in the in the extensions uh, menu, and then notify you. Uh, so there was a little bell for icon for the notifications, uh, and you could go see directly one of the requests uh, in the platform with this button. Um, so yeah, we did a few uh, basic uh, functionalities, uh, but uh, they didn't like it. Uh, it turns out the National Transparency Platform, the general direction of uh, information technologies at uh, INAI, was not very happy with the way we, we were uh, doing things. Um, they, they started claiming that we were uh, destroying a public good. Um, and they started blocking our users. Um, the first 
first time we, we, we met with them, I said, like me personally, said, what's the limit of requests we can do? Just tell me the limit. We'll respect it. And they never told us the limit. So we did what we wanted. And they said that was too much. So we again asked, what's the limit? And they didn't say. They just started uh, blocking users who did too many requests. And this affected everyone, not just us. Uh, and they started uh, blocking the accounts of journalists, of researchers, of our users. Uh, we, we have a record of uh, more than 20 accounts that were blocked. Um, so we decided to stop with the extension because we were not helping anyone. Um, and they weren't very, they didn't like what we were doing. So next up, we said, let's improve how we are managing uh, the answers, the replies. Um, so we said, okay, we're going to do version two. It will be a web-based system that allows you to search, classify, and share privately your information requests. But no, we didn't do that. Uh, why didn't we do that? Um, there was no enough demand. We, uh, we were talking with uh, media organizations around the country um, and we needed to create a whole uh, user management solution uh, to handle teams and to handle uh, how the information flows inside uh, the redactions of newspapers. And that was a lot of work for us. Uh, our funding was running out. We had originally we had a Google News Initiative uh, grant to do this project, uh, we had spent most of, fun of the funding doing the, the extension, uh, and this was a lot of work, so we put it on hold. And we change again how we think about this. So this slide uh, tries to represent the way we think of freedom of information uh, requests as being one directional, from the citizen to the institution, and then the answer. But the system is actually much more like this, uh, where you have questions, you have answers, and you have a way in which institutions can see what the um, citizens are asking for. Uh, so we thought maybe we can use uh, the whole database of answers uh, to ask a way of listening to the citizens. Uh, so we decided to create customizable tools to generate strategic knowledge from the National Transparency Platform data. These are, these are B3. This is the, the current version that we have uh, running right now. Uh, so how do we work with this information? Uh, PLA Info supplies customized tools to generate strategic knowledge from, well, this is the same thing. We have three, uh, three main parts. One is alerts, then there's monitoring, and then there's research. I'm going to tell you about all three. Uh, so alerts. With the alerts, you uh, decide which keyword, keywords you want to monitor. This could be a brand, a person, an institution uh, or any topic. Uh, and every time, well, every day, we download the new answers for the, for the previous day. And if there's a matching answer to your question, we send an email to you. Uh, we have several, uh, several people receiving emails right now, and they are very happy to be notified with such a, such a timeliness of the topic, the answers regarding the topics they care about. This allows them to anticipate uh, situations like uh, questions that might be coming to them later or uh, research that's the, that, that is being done on the topic they care about. Um, 
so this is uh, really useful. It's, it's proving to be really useful to have a notification when uh, you have an answer. Uh, this is an example here, uh, desaparecidos. This is uh, disappearing people, who is, uh, which is a very big problem here in Mexico. Uh, and you can see it's, it's been getting worse as time progresses in this, um, in this time series uh, at the bottom of the, of the screen. Uh, each year we have more uh, requests mentioning um, disappearances. Uh, this is the, the way you see the alert in your email. Um, you, you get the, the search term and you get the, the name of the institution that uh, got the, the request. And then you get either the answer with the with a keyword or the or the question, or sometimes the attached files also can mention the the term. Uh, then there's monitoring. Uh, monitoring, uh, we create a dashboard for you, where you can see the trends um, of uh, of a topic uh, across time. So um, this allows you to, to monitor the situation uh, regarding uh, your, your topic. Uh, again, with the desaparecido example, here you can see in which states the requests have been for those uh, for the topic. Uh, Federación, that's the whole country. Uh, then Jalisco is the state with more uh, requests regarding uh, disappearances. Then Mexico City. Then Sinaloa, Mexico State, Puebla, and Veracruz, those get uh, the most requests. Uh, this is an example dashboard. Uh, this is another example dashboard. Uh, in this case, we're looking for a very grim death civilians uh, topic. Uh, and here you can see the words that are related to uh, the topic. Um, and um, and you can see which institutions got the requests. Uh, this is the National Defense Secretary, National Mar Marines, uh, the police, National Guard, and the judiciary branch also is here. Um, so you can see the words and the institutions and the amount. Uh, this is another example dashboard. Uh, but uh, we have millions of requests in the database. So maybe you're not satisfied with having your own dashboard. And what you want is to be able to explore the database on your own. So that's why we have the other uh, product which we call research, and which allows you to create your own dashboards and your own research. Uh, in this case, we're searching for uh, data or CSV or JSON or Excel or spreadsheet or table or open format. And 1.5 million, that's around uh, almost a third of all requests are asking for open data. Uh, and this is a very interesting uh, statistic, I think. Uh, people in Mexico are really aware of how to ask for data that is reusable. Uh, another example dashboard, another example dashboard. Uh, yeah. So uh, with the research um, product, you can, as I said, search a across all the historic questions archive, create your own visualization dashboards and customized reports with the support of the abrimos.info team, our courses and the documentation. Uh, this bar here is the, the way we, uh, we can see all the visualizations that can be created. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a live demo right now of our product if I have two more minutes. Uh, so this is the, 
uh, this is the thing. Uh, uh, we were we decided we we're going to go with democracy here. Uh, so democracia is a term that's been present in six thousand ninety two answers starting June two thousand and three and counting, uh, and it's related to some other words like citizenship, rights, politics, right, social, humane, or human uh, participation, data, constitution. So those, those topics are related to democracy in the questions. We're just uh, looking at questions right now. Uh, so 2003 was the year with more requests related to democracy. Uh, there's been around uh, one each day, almost one uh, answer each day, 0.8 answers per day. And the average to answer this uh, request with this topic is 14.8 days, which is uh, barely in, in, in the limits of the law. Um, but you can see here, there, there has the extemporaneous are the, the ones that have uh, been out of time. So we have a lot of uh, answers that have been um, um, answered later than they should have. And we have some uh, details here. Uh, this is an example uh, of question. This one is from two days ago. Uh, and democracy should be mentioned around, uh, it's, too, it's too long. We don't see it here in this view. Let me try another one, this one. Consolidate and enlarge democratic, uh, part participatory democratic uh, mechanism, blah, blah, blah. So this person is asking for something, the activities of a, a member of the parliament uh, and the answer is, we don't, this is not for us. Uh, because they were asking to Morena, Morena is the party. So the party is claiming that they don't know the activities of the member of the parliament. So maybe they should ask the parliament or who knows. But the, this, the interesting thing is that parties are also covered by the law. Uh, so you can do uh, lots of interesting, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about your use case when, when, when you're looking at this database. Uh, you can filter, let's say we want participation too. So we're filtering democracy here and participation here. We only have 1000 answers, uh, but let's say we're going to, uh, we want to go to the state level. So this is state level. Now we only have 248 answers. Uh, and maybe we want to have answers that happen within last year. So that's 127. Uh, and in this case, last year, uh, participatory democracy at the state level was asked to Aguascalientes, the Electoral Institute in Aguascalientes. Uh, so this is a way uh, for you to discover uh, how topics are more relevant in some areas of the country uh, than others. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation. Uh, I'm going to skip all this, so I did the the demo. Uh, so Abrimos Info has a product called Teseo ETL, uh, Thesis ETL, uh, which uh, converts the data and uploads it to the database for publishing and uh, alerts. I'm not going to go into details. Oh, so it's very hard to download the data because the National Transparency Platform publishes it, but doesn't actually want you to have it. So they block you if, you if you do too many requests. And it's really hard to ask. You have to ask for an email. Then you have to check the email, get the URL from the email, download the data, 
it's really hard. Uh, then you get, you know, some uh, CSV file, we trans transform it to JSON, and then you, we upload it to the database. And then we create the, the email alerts and the website. The website is still not published yet, but it's uh, we, have, we have some uh, progress with the website. Uh, and we want to do uh, this data processing for all kinds of data, not only the, the freedom of information requests, uh, but uh, we are doing um, the candidates for the elections in at least three countries. We have Argentina, Colombia, and Mexico. Uh, then we're doing contracts. Uh, we, we have uh, in Sociedad.info, we have published the contracts for Guatemala, but we have worked with contracts in seven different countries. Um, so, what are the next steps for PIDA Info? First, uh, finish the OCR of all the attached files. Each answer has an attached file with an average of uh, one megabyte. Uh, so that's around nine terabytes of data that we need to process. Uh, and the server is very slow, so we, uh, we are barely uh, starting with this. Uh, we're going back through the years, um, we want to do all of them. Uh, and then we want to incorporate more related data sets, such as the complaints data set. Uh, the National Transparency Platform allows you to complain if you're not satisfied with an answer. Uh, and this will go to the commissioners of INAI. And the commissioners will decide whether or not you're right and will uh, mandate the institution to give you the information they denied you. Um, so this is, I, I think institutionally, this is a great system. Um, and so we want to publish the website uh, I mentioned, uh, it's going to be in pidala.info. Right now you're going to only see a, la a landing page there. Uh, and we want to continue with our incidents process uh, and relaunch the extension. So we, want to become friends with the uh, technology um, direction inside INAI, uh, so they allow us to continue with our original project. Uh, I want to replicate uh, this PIDALA info. For instance, Paraguay, we know, has a unified database. Uh, we know Brazil already has a similar project called Achados e Pedidos. Uh, so, uh, we invite you to work with us uh, to change the paradigm for access to information in Latin America. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That is a completely different way of thinking about analyzing and looking at FOI requests. Um, so it's really, really interesting to hear from you. Thank you so much. Uh, there will be time for questions later, but I am gonna hand over to Lisette Hamming from Spoon in the Netherlands. Um, she's gonna walk us through the journey from FOI site to full blown foundation to show you what could be possible. Off you go, Lisette. Thank you, Jen. And um, is the presentation visible now? Ready? Yeah, thanks. And also taking up the whole. So this is better, I think. Do you see one slide? Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you, Martin. It was uh, a pleasure listening listening to all your. Um, all your effort and uh, everything that you already have reached. It's um, next level for, for us here in the Netherlands. And also to make me feel rather small with our uh, ambitions here in the Netherlands and the, the, the fact that, that Mexico even you know, has a national transparency platform um, 
is already a lot different from what um, is arranged here in the Netherlands. We don't have a platform like that, which is one of the reasons that we were very happy to read about Alavadeli and the software that they made available for, amongst others, us here. Um, and also to hear you talk about how you look at things, Martin, um, confirms for me the the um, the whole difference between and the differences that are possible in the way you um, approach this um, same ambitions in such uh, different ways. I'll talk about that today in my presentation um, because it's I think it's 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 the most important. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, conclusion that I would um, share would like to share with you, and uh, I, I always in the Netherlands we have a tendency to use a lot of proverbs and mostly to end all discussions. Um, so I always have a uh, fun in trying to uh, make Google translate translate our proverbs, and we have one that says. Shoemaker, stick to your last, which I think doesn't translate at all what it's supposed to do. I've no idea what if last is also uh, what it should mean in the Dutch proverb, but it, the the idea is that uh, as a shoemaker you stick with what you know and what you um, and what you can. Um, so as a uh, as a um, good girl with a legal background, I start with the questions that Jen and Emma uh, um, asked us to answer in this meeting, which is uh, the following, as you can see on the slide, and you probably all have seen, try to answer um, in our own ways. Um, and immediately the first question and the, and, the, and the other question that was sent afterwards about what's, what is our strategy made me realize that um, I wonder if we really have a strategy. So uh, we started um, five years with uh, ago with um, creating or translating the Alvatelli software to uh, the Dutch um, uh, reality. Uh, and two years ago, um, founded a organization to um, maintain the platform um, and uh, I, we did have a plan of course and we written the plan also after the first year but I was wondering preparing for this presentation whether it was a strategy and what is the difference um, so thank you my society for bringing that bringing that up um, so who's us? That's Tim and me, the two of us, two freelancers. And um, that's it. Of course, we have some other freelancers that helped us with setting up the organization and creating the website and, and our own uh, creating our own style and story. But it's just Tim and I who, uh, who are the organization at this moment. And um, I think the fact that we are the organization at the moment defines um, a lot uh, our um, strategy and the way we uh, uh, we look at how we um, can add to transparency in in the Netherlands because um, we both have legal backgrounds which has pros and cons we'll get back to that later and we both previ previously were investigative journalists um, not even for a very long time, but enough to get um, pretty well settled in the um, in the sector, um, which is mainly a pro, I think. And um, as an or as uh, the organization, we uh, started with privately uh, funded um, finances for three years by three founding partners, which I think also um tells a lot or or or, or um uh, uh says a lot about how we started because we had the possibility to um take some steps for a longer period of time and um we had the woe 
uh, generator in the wall, Knop, um, which is the Alivatelli platform, already developed via an, another organization that we were involved with when we were still investigative journalists and um, with the help of my society and Adesium Foundation. So, and the VO generator VO is the freedom of information law in the Netherlands. And with the gen generator, you can generate a request. And with the VO knop, as most of you, I think, know, you can, via the Elevatelli platform, send the request and manage your process. Um, and we had a plan, not a strategy, but a plan, uh, mostly focused on overdue maintenance because there wasn't any um, any information online about how uh, freedom of information request pro procedures should look like or uh, work in, in the Netherlands, not at all. Only some outdated um, attempts by mostly journalists. Um, and we had our ambitions, of course. Um, so this is the the screenshot of the generator and one of the um, platform. And um, our main focus from the beginning and still is to um, share to together and share knowledge about the freedom of information rights in the Netherlands. Um, probably again because of our legal backgrounds, it's um, and and because in the Netherlands it's legally very. Uh, complicated that I can talk a day about how we came to that, but that's why you need a, a lot of um, legal knowledge in the Netherlands if you want to um, have success with your requests, um, especially if you don't want to give up um, right away. Um, but again, maybe that's also uh, the way we look at it because we have the legal background. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the Vo Generator and the Vo Knop were um, maintain maintained and, um, and further developed. I had experience with another tool and knew that if you don't um, put time, effort and money in maintenance, then the product dies really quickly. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the freedom of information rights in the Netherlands um, got stronger and the execution got better. So we translated it in our plan uh, to three main areas of focus, the knowledge database, the management and developing of the two and more tools that we um, thought were necessary in the Netherlands and still are. One of them, the what we're working on right now is a, a forum where you can exchange information on your uh, knowledge and experience with uh, with the freedom of information and, and the requests. Um, but we'll see, Martin, whether uh, there's demand for that in the Netherlands. That's so one of the things that I realized that we think a lot about how we expect this to be important and that there are people um, eager to use these kind of tools, but we have never done real marketing re um, market research about it. So um, we'll see. <laughs> um, uh, and that's also probably the reason why we're uh, careful with putting a lot of time and effort in it from the beginning, so we try to take it step by step. Um, and the third is research, lobby, and strategic litigation. Strategic litigation is for us a logic step, again, because of the legal background, but also doing the research and lobby. I'll talk a bit about that more uh, in the coming part of the presentation. Um, so what uh, what does our site or organization do differently to a standard Elevatelli site? And to be honest, reading the question, I thought, hmm, not much yet, which we are very well aware of. We've chosen to, um, for various reasons, and I'll um, get back to the reasons too, uh, we've chosen to also take the platform step by step and not 
for example, put all the authorities in, in the platform from the beginning, but we started with the lower authorities and then uh, after a year or so um, and trying out the, uh, the what's the English name for that, bulk to the, the, the pro version, uh, we, we decided to only put the authorities in the platform database that um, that communicated online that they are uh, that they are um, uh, that they um, accept information requests that are emailed to them. In the Netherlands, it's only been almost a year that they have to accept the information requests sent by email, but a lot of authorities still don't. And we decided to uh, get in contact with each of the authorities that don't um, by a, a research that we've done and uh, uh, and uh, experienced that um, that it was uh, very effective to um, to get in in touch with the authorities instead of just throwing requests at a email address that wasn't meant for freedom of information requests so that's our careful step by step an example of our careful step step by step approach. Um, but we'd love to do more with the platform. And one of the reasons is that we would love to integrate our knowledge database and tools more with a platform. Um, and we love to be able to do that ourselves. But again, one of the cons of being to, um, only legally educated is that we don't have any idea how, and we're still looking for people and funding to make that possible. Um, and organization wise, our focus from the beginning has been, again, on the knowledge and legal um, information about freedom of information requests, and also um, on professionals, which there's a lot to say about that, whether that was smart or not, but that's the way we started and um, where we're uh, still focusing mostly on. Then um, wondering what the making this decision made us, um, which things we we cannot do because of of this approach. Um, I think the biggest um, downside to our approach is that we don't focus on quantity, but more on the quality of what we gather, share, and. Um, help with. Um, also, when I was listening to Martin, I, I again realized that that's one of the, ma the main differences, I think, between us and many of the other um, platform managers. We, we, we are relatively um, um, careful and, um, and not very activist minded. Um, which also has pros and cons, obviously. Um, and also, for example, with the strategic litigation, we don't litigate as, for example, fact in status in Germany, um, getting more documents um, in the public domain, but we litigate on how the process, how the, how the right uh, to information is um, can can be stronger. So it has we we um, our procedures procedures are about um, access to information. For example, that in the Netherlands, when you ask for information via an online form that the authority puts on the website, they ask you to put your um, to log in with a we call DigiD. So you have to identify yourself, identify yourself first, which we don't agree with and is also not um, legally something that they can do. So we we um, we we um, litigate against those kind of um, practices, not so much on on a, a specific group of documents or or um, investigation. We do um, uh, we do help journalists and other um, NGOs and professional freedom of information requesters uh, with their proceedings, but we don't start those kind of proceedings yet. 
ourselves. So being, a, being that uh, legal uh, educated good girl, uh, I uh, changed the question a bit in, this, in the sense that uh, I wonder if it's, um, if it's even uh, linked the successes and challenges to, to our strategy slash plan. Um, but uh, if so, then I would say that the challenges we face, of course, are money and time, but money mostly comes from the fact that our funding partners at the moment are very um, big and... Um, trust trusted uh, um, foundations and we wonder if we would become more activist and um, focused on quantity more than quality if we would uh, still be interested for yeah I would say those kind of funders um, and at the same time wonder if another way of making that quantity of requests would bring enough money to the table to to continue as an organization so we're struggling still with that and um, um, trying to find our way um, time wise it's very practical but we're not allowed to work all week on this organization because in the Netherlands we're limited to two and a half days a week as long as we're a freelance as we are, so it it uh, creates a situation where the both of us together are only one person who works on the organization per week, which isn't a lot. So we try to um, to work with other freelancers to make sure that all of us together can do more. But it would be, of course, more interesting for us if we can work on the organization um, five days a week each. Um, then we also have a challenge in wondering how to team or not team up with the dark side, which we call the dark side, the government officials in, um, in, in developing, uh, the organization, but also developing the platform, the, the Elevatelli platform, um, uh, and 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 the the platform I would say stays behind a bit at the moment. Um, we had a presentation at government agency, uh, a big one, um, a national one, um, the other day, uh, which um, created a lot of interesting contexts for us. So it's it's becoming more and more um, possible to. Um, to get in touch with them on this and to see how the information that they have about how it's um, the, the requests are handled at the, the other side, at the dark side, um, uh, can be transferred to us so that we understand better how our um, activities and tools can, can be uh, more interesting uh, for both sides. Um, and then last... Uh, because I chose four, maybe I could could have chosen uh, more. But the lacking of experience that, were, that I was talking about earlier, we are we, the only thing we know is um, the law, and we have no software development skills or um, knowledge about data protection or security. So we um, need to look for other for others to help us with that if we want to develop more interesting tools and um, ways to to uh, proceed. Um, successes, I would say that we do have funding, which is, I think, a good thing, and also for a longer period of time. So it makes it possible to not to stress, stress too much about how long we can continue um, and how. Um, we also, to name one of the examples, because time is running up already, um, have uh, good ways to, um, we have found a very large, it's DGP Media, that's one of the largest of two media organizations in the Netherlands that control now over six, seven newspapers. And we, we train them and we advise a lot of journalists and organizations 
which is also always a challenge because of course there's always only 24 hours in a day and only two and a half in a week per person. But um, we found ways to do that pretty efficiently. So there's we're, we're still the one and only in this field and more and more professionals find their ways to, to us. Um, and the same goes for the the research and lobby, but I, I, I will skip a bit because it's taking too long. Um, the strong and important network that we've been developing is, I think, also a very um, positive effect of the way how we um, focus, um, because um, the contacts and the, the, the leads that we are creating are uh, are, are are strong and uh, makes uh, for example that we 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 know that um also decision makers and policy makers um take us seriously and relatively soon because we're only two two years uh, on the block um and we're accessible uh which makes it also possible to connect quickly with a lot of people so there are a few successes that are very uh, visible, um, which we we got. Uh, Tim would say an awkward award, but that's awkward because it's been so soon. Um, but really nice, of course, that we've already granted uh, an award for our efforts, um, and we found um, already a, a pretty. Um, important uh, um, media outlets to uh, be able to talk about our mission and uh, and the freedom of information in the Netherlands. So the fact that we've been working there and that we still have a strong network in the media is, is, is an advantage that I think uh, we should be very um, happy with. There, of course, there's also some successes that are less visible. Um, for example, when certain activists or policymakers respond to our post and and um, efforts, uh, for example, the 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 journalists that write about um, freedom of information based uh, research that we help them with, and sometimes they literally mention us in their reports, and sometimes they don't, but then we still know that it was part of our help, so that we can. Um, brag about that and the government report there was a very important research in the Netherlands last year we were one of the parties that could um, give input on on how freedom of information is going in the Netherlands so also happy to be um, to be able to do so um, so coming back to the questions that my society was hoping that we would answer I would say that we can conclude that one edited or not plan does not make a strategy yet. So we will be working on that one, which made me um, remember a poem that I was always very fond uh, of uh, by Emily Dickinson and um, rewriting after thinking of that poem, that an edited plan is better than nothing, but we'll be working on our strategy. It's a good point to make that more clear and also to be able to um, make clear how we want to edit uh, and change our strategy. So thanks again. And please do reach out if you want to um, connect on whatever ways we can to strengthen each other and uh, Martin, I will definitely connect to you. I'm looking forward to the third presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisette. Really appreciate you sharing. Um, I know you're one of the newer sites and it was just interesting for us because obviously we know how you started from the journalism network for VOJ, just seeing you grow through the site and then the foundation that you created and the funding has just been amazing. So thank you so much for, for talking us through. Um, okay, finally, we are gonna hear from Miguel from Datasketch in Peru. Um, 
Miguel's going to talk about how they do their data visualization work and how their new site draws from FOI and what the decision making process was to get there. Um, so take it away, Miguel. Hello, everyone. Now you should be seeing my screen. Uh, I'm Miguel Alor, and based just in Peru, but uh, Data Sketch is a company mainly based in Colombia. We have projects worldwide. So again, my name is Miguel. I'm a specialist in public sector innovation and digital government. Uh, so I work mainly in the intersection of technology and communications to solve public issues. Uh, Data Sketch, I'm a project manager uh, where we help uh, governments, NGOs, and newsrooms to harness the benefits of data science and web-based technologies. And what gathers us here is freedom of information. So some of us have developed the standard Alavitelli sites. We particularly developed uh, the Queremos Datos. Uh, in Spanish, uh, it means we want data, a uh, request for information site. Uh, so then, okay, we got information, we published it in the website. And the question that comes to our mind is, uh, okay, now what? Uh, for us, uh, freedom of information is the basis for empowering citizens with information uh, to make evidence-based decisions. However, there are uh, many problems that appear, right? Uh, freedom of information sites are often either very long running, they can feel a bit stuck and where to go next. Sometimes uh, there is a need for rejuvenating the user base, uh, or they rather are new and have a million of ideas, but no clue where to start or what, or where to go next. Uh, also, public sector information is not understandable or useful. And usually, why is that? It's because, uh, because of the outcome when someone requests freedom of information. Uh, uh, request. So there are sometimes long PDF documents with unstructured data or not reusable maps or even worse. Uh, this is a, a request of information for information that I did in, in Peru. And it, this was a scanned PDF uh, with some signatures. Uh, it was very, very bad to work with this. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we get the structured databases in a machine readable format, uh, but uh, the data in this format uh, just amplifies the digital gap because it is only useful for tech savvy people, data scientists, and developers, but not for uh, people in general. So, how to transform data into, let's say, user friendly interfaces is the, the question. Uh, and most important, how to empower citizens with the obtained public sector information. Uh, some things that have worked for us in data sketch is that access to information is embedded in the core of data sketch. Our vision is uh, to be a social technology company with a global impact focused on promoting democratic access and effective communication of verified information through user-friendly interface to contribute to a more equitable and sustainable society. And their mission is to facilitate the collective construction of knowledge and evidence-based decision-making. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary team uh, full of social communicators, mathematicians, software developers, political and data scientists. And we're also a, a quite international uh, team. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm based in Peru. Uh, and this means that we, of course, uh, have developed this freedom of information request as, as queremos datos, but we want to go further and make that information accessible to everyone uh, through visualizations, dashboards, and other user-friendly interfaces. Uh, for this, we have uh, our product that is a self-service data management system. Uh, that allows to store the data in the cloud and interoperate it uh, with uh, other public databases. Uh, you can access recurring public data sources, upload your data, 
uh, and interoperate with open and public data uh, that is shared also by other users. Uh, you can uh, visualize it, uh, analyze it very easily, just create, adjust, and automate uh, customized uh, charts and graphics and visualizations in an easy and friendly way. Uh, you can download the, the visualizations, share them in your companies if, if you have these accounts in datasketch.co, and even embed it in your uh, websites. Uh, these all, all these uh, visualizations will be automatically uh, updated as you uh, update also the data source. And, but also one example of this is, uh, let's say, uh, data analysis and integration with uh, various data sources. Uh, this project is called Trees of Bogota. Uh, we requested information about the urban census of tree planting in Bogota. We crossed that information with interviews with environmental experts to understand the city challenges. And we released the information to the public in a visual and interactive way. Uh, something that also have worked for us is the integration of uh, data standards, uh, like the open contracting data standard. Uh, or OCDS, uh, because uh, and, and also the development of intuitive uh, data visualizations and dashboards. Uh, thanks to the adoption of open standards such as the OCDS, we had the opportunity to implement sites that can monitor risks in uh, public procurement in any country that follows these uh, data standards. So we have uh, done this in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Peru. Uh, we open the data through easy to understand visualizations. Uh, in Ecuador, we also, actually in collaboration with Abrimos Info, we developed uh, the Red Flags in Corruption website uh, that shows some, uh, let's say, procurement risks where, I don't know, just one bidder for procurement, uh, uh, just there is just one bidder in the procurement call, or the winner is the last bid, or there is no transparency in the procurement process. All, all of them are red flags in public procurement, and we try to show them in this uh, portal. And this right in the center is the cheat map. Uh, with Transparency International, we shared the data on freedom of information access request on procurement health products during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we made it accessible, and we cross it with media coverage in health uh, corruption around the world. Uh, also, other uh, solution that have uh, worked for us is uh, this uh, effort of taking the data off the screen and make it wearable. So we also go from data science to advocacy of social issues that are meaningful to each of us. Uh, let's say gender gap, digital gap, climate change, LGBTQI plus rights, violence issues, uh, among others. Uh, right now I'm wearing a, a t-shirt that uh, is also advocating for uh, LGBTQI uh, uh, rights. So this and lately uh, we are implementing uh, AI chatbots for accessible data interaction. So in, as, as I mentioned before, yeah, one uh, public institution may uh, share the data in a, a machine readable format, but this is all useful for tech savvy people. Uh, so AI chatbots uh, allows us to ask uh, questions and get answers uh, from live data in the procurement system uh, that adaptable to any country that follows the open contracting data standard. And the answers come not just in text, but in various formats. Uh, it can be graphics or maps. And the main difference with ChatGPT is that this is based on a real database. Uh, so accuracy is ensured, you know, that ChatGPT can give like random answers that could be wrong or biased, as we have seen. Uh, but this is based on a real database. And for us, the next steps on, on this matter is, is jump from uh, procurement data to elections data. 
uh, given that there, uh, there are already some standards, uh, at least in the United States, the National Institute of Standards and Technology have uh, uh, managed and developed the selection results common data format specification in order to be to make this data more accessible to anyone that are not necessarily uh, data scientists or, or developers. Uh, some of our strategic choices uh, have been this uh, collaborative approach. So we have uh, collaborated yeah, with uh, um, international organizations such as Transparency International, the International Republican Institute, but also with ministries, with local, local governments, NGOs, uh, big partnerships like the Open Government Partnership or the Open Contracting Partnership. Um, where we divided uh, the tasks and, and depending also based on our experience and our, let's say, uh, our strengths. So they are the experts on their issues and we are their data science support and that's something that have worked for us. Uh, we also focus on user-friendly interfaces to ensure broader accessibility. Uh, data is just a lot of unintelligible information if it's not transformed into a friendly face interface. Uh, so data visualizations, AI chatbots, it's what we are working right now in, in order to ensure this, this broader accessibility. Uh, also, something that has worked for us is tailoring content and tools to meet specific community needs. Uh, so understand what do they do with the information that has been requested and how can we make it more accessible are uh, some strategic choices that we, we, we have made. Um, other things that has worked for us is uh, the architecture of our solutions. So uh, we try to make uh, our products uh, very modular. So, uh, so we have a model for request, a model for table sharing, model for data visualization, more model for interactive dashboards to AI chatbots. So they are they can work as uh, building blocks that are uh, interconnected and that are adaptable to to any circumstance. Uh, and this is also key for us. Uh, to think uh, and to ask ourselves, what do our users need? What does our uh, beneficiary public uh, need? And for this uh, design thinking methodology has uh, worked for us. So we focus on user-friendly interfaces over complex coding requirements, how to choose the right technology and features based on community needs, uh, the importance of visual tools uh, in making data accessible for everyone. And, and for this, yes, of course, it's important to find and engage the audience. Uh, uh, so some techniques for audience analysis and engagement, uh, also the analytics on our websites and our platforms that we are developing are, are key. And we usually, uh, we like to tailor con our content and tools to meet the specific uh, um, community needs or partner needs in order to, to solve the, the public issues we are trying to, to tackle. Um, so uh, for learnings, uh, yes, the collaborative approach, the focus on user friendly interfaces, as, as we have mentioned, the modular, architect or modular architecture, uh, something very important uh, that I'm gonna uh, steal from the previous presenters is the, the network. Uh, so NGOs uh, working with media organizations, with the government institutions, it's key for to, to, to achieve success in the projects. Uh, and we, when we have not uh, uh, collaborated with other organizations, it has been very um, more difficult uh, to, to implement some projects. And also something that, that Martin mentioned is that freedom of information should not just be in one direction, uh, but it 
it should be like a cycle that empowers citizens with information to make evidence-based uh, uh, decisions. Um, yes, I, I can show some of, of, of our projects that we have implemented on, on this on this regard because data in the end informs decision making uh, before and during elections. So we have implemented uh, election, uh, no, this is a candidate uh, information uh, site uh, where anyone can access it. Uh, there is a dashboard, you can explore all the candidates up to the parliament, their political stances, education levels, if they have uh, been in some controversies or concerns. Uh, and this will inform uh, people, particularly here in Colombia, uh, uh, in order to have a, a vote, uh, an evidence-based vote. Um, we have also uh, shared uh, the data, the elections results uh, in portals in, in, in many different countries. The, and particularly in Colombia, we have also uh, Cross that information uh, with uh, the information of uh, financing of political campaigns that are very important in order, in order to uh, detect some, uh, it's not procurement risk, but uh, political risks. And this has been also quite important for us uh, because it allowed us to. Uh, first, they win some awards, like the Sigma Award or the One Infra Award or the Gabriel Garcia Marquez Award, but also uh, to show uh, to the citizens what uh, risk situations could be happening in their countries. Like, uh, because yeah, some party has been financed for this or company that is winning a lot of procurement uh, calls in. In, in the country and so on. So this is uh, very important for us to, to also transparent this information so people can be empowered uh, first and can uh, have a, a better decision making when, when choosing who will be the, their political officials or the uh, representatives in the parliament and so on. So. Yes, uh, this is uh, what we do, uh, and I hope uh, you you like the presentation. And if you have questions, uh, we will be glad to to answer them. Thank you so much, Miguel. That was absolutely amazing and showed so much more than what I knew about what you already did. So really exciting to hear about everything.